Um, um, oh, spirits, I call upon thee. I beseech that you come and speak to us from beyond the grave. Stop. <laughs> It's me, Snark, and today I'm bringing in my good pal, Mika. Hey! Mika is here to help me uh, be able to talk for this video, since I was having trouble. And But more importantly, it's because Mika finally was able to finish watching the season one of The Ghost of Molly McGee. And, like, we got things to talk about. This is not important. Indeed. I'm very glad, happy that you strong armed me into finishing the show. <laughs> Oh yeah, you know when I like just put my hand onto your collar and just like, LOOK AT IT! <laughs> LOOK AT IT! I'm ugly and I'm proud. <laughs> but yeah, so like, it was important, especially because, guys, guys, she stopped like right before all this cool stuff was happening towards the latter end of the season. And I was just like, oh my god, you can't stop there. Look, it's the show's fault for having an episode about cleaning a toilet. Well, maybe, maybe if you can't handle the show at its cleaning the toilet, then maybe you don't deserve it at its best. Did you ever think of that? Well, you know, maybe, but I'm also a rebel. <laughs> oh, yes. Look at you, shooting yourself in the foot. You must feel so proud. Hmm. Well, if I don't deserve it, then why am I here? <laughs> Mostly because you're helping me. But, yes, uh, so what we plan on doing, guys, is pretty much going to just hang out. We're going to be talking about the show, stuff that we like, and I hope you guys enjoy. Yes. Have fun watching art happen while we talk nonsense. You know that's not the important part. <laughs> so, like, this show, I don't think there's been a show in a while that we've watched where I've literally, like, just constantly kept just, like, bursting out laughing. It's very nice to hear. We don't often uh, usually mute your mic when we watch stuff together, but because of, like, new technical in <laughs> innovations, I was able to actually hear you while we watch stuff together, and that's very delightful. Yeah, so, like, you just have me in the background, just anytime Scratch ends up doing something, I'm like, ha 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 ha! <laughs> I mean, to be fair, it is contagious, because, like, I'm so used to just sitting by myself, um with just myself by the computer, like, even if I do find something hilarious, I just end up doing, you know, the fucking nose, just, like, the, just that. <laughs> oh, I want you to know, every time we're watching stuff, if something makes me laugh, I'm usually doing that full-on, like, wow, where do they get this from, sort of laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been missing out, like, that sort of stuff is contagious, man, like, I have the most fun when I watch stuff, uh, watch things with, like, together with people I can hear them, and, like, <laughs> yeah, I remember we also had that when we watched, uh, when Mika came from Sweden to, like, Ohio, uh, when we went to go see, um, Captain Underpants. Like, I feel like we had a very similar experience of just both of us being the only adults in the room, just, like, laughing at the screen. <laughs> I don't think we were the only adults, actually, like, it, you know, it was the Dollar Theater, so there weren't, like, much people there at all. Uh, but I oh, remember yeah, it was, was, was like uh, one like adult in front of us, and then like I think one or two kids like on like the other side of the room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, like everyone else is silent in the room, so it's pretty much like ghost town anyway. And <laughs> then you just have us going, "Woo, that's funny." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to ignore that big old crack in the wall. <laughs> it okay. It, we... it added character to the film. <laughs> It added character to the location. <laughs> yeah. It was very, like, very retro. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, and so, like, that's one of those things of, like, with this show. It's a very simple show. Yeah. The plot itself, I feel like it's usually whatever the goal is for the day, and then both character and world hijinks kind of getting in the way. And it allows for the comedy of the characters to shine the most and which i feel like 
that's what that's like why I watch the show. It's like I can turn my brain off and just be dumb laughing at like the different voice acting and the humor that they end up popping out. Yeah, yeah. It is it is a very funny show. Like I I um just here for like all the quips and like some of just the timing is just Im- impeccable. They're also just cute characters. Just yes. like Molly and Scratch's friendship in general. It's especially yes. especially when you compare where we started off from with him being like, "Oh no, I cursed me." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it's interesting. Like you don't because it's so episodic, I don't think and and I also because there was like a bit of a space between like benching for me because of cutting off a bit over halfway but it's like it's kind of like a subtle growth that scratch goes through like you can see that he is just like by the end of the series he's just so much more caring and considerate and just generally like just and clearly also just a generally happier person than he was in the beginning of the show yeah 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 and you have it so like even stuff that inconveniences him for example the the episode that we saw uh, I think a few days ago, the one where Dad ends up getting hurt and can't work, and they're trying to pay the hospital bill. Just him going from where the beginning of the show, he would have just been like, <laughs> "Yeah, good luck with that," to now him completely being like, "No, we're all part of the family. We got this. It's easy peasy McGeezy." Oh, I like that. Like, yeah, I've been saving that for a while. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, he just becomes the mom of the house like for a while, and it's both hilarious and adorable he looked so good in that apron also just i want to say with like uh pete in the episode the dad i really liked (laughs) like he has a few moments in the show that are very pathetic man (laughs) like white man specifically it's it's a different breed of man (laughs) yeah because you have like you had the episode with his siblings where which to be fair hashtag relatable with uh whenever i feel like I'm alone with my family. I become a more pathetic person, mm. more sad. But you have like stuff like that. But then you also had the goat episode where Scratch is able to train him to, to like respond to like crackers and do whatever he wants and just like positive reinforcement. He's oh, I'm a good dad. Yeah, that that was. Um. <laughs> it's okay. I know what you want to say. You want to say is like. Awaken something in me if it wasn't already there. <laughs> Wide awake. Like, if you weren't already into, if you didn't already like have a thing for praise, just pretty much be like, oh, this man needs to be told that he's a good boy. <laughs> yeah, like I just, I, I love, I love pathetic men. It has it. The show has it. Like again with the the episode when he gets hurt, you have it where just him literally being the baby of the family. <laughs> Yes, oh my god. Oh, if it weren't there being another more powerful dynamic ship, I can see why someone might be into whatever they got going on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's interesting. Like, I mean, they they could have been close to, like, sort of doing, um, basically paralleling Beetlejuice and the couple and, like, the, the musical version of them. That, oh. that's like, like it was almost that, but like I feel like I feel like Scratch isn't really close enough to Mr. and Mrs. Uh, McGee in that way for for that to really feel that type of dynamic there. Yeah, no, it it very much is. Oh, so like I just kind of adopted a mom and a dad, no big. Yeah. Which I think that works, especially considering Scratch's thing with since the beginning of I like being alone. I don't need nobody. And they don't need me. I, you know what? In fact, I don't even want them to like me. <laughs> Especially, like, you have those moments where he's like, he just melts into the hugs and just happily gives them. And it's like, wow, episode one Scratch wouldn't have done this. Yeah, yeah. Just like, I am 100% here for the feels, you know, on top of everything else. But you know how I am about the feels. <laughs> Found family is such an important just trope in general. Like, not only do you have the found family, but... It's important to distinguish that it's not just the Molly and Scratch becoming best friends forever sort of thing. It's literally, you have moments where each of like the family members are worried about each other or caring about each other. And, and, and it's just, it does my heart good. It's like, yeah, this is a literal family. 
And then, like, when you have stuff like uh, episodes, like, when Scratch finally got to meet Grandma Nim, and just him going, like, oh, I've heard your food is so good. She's like... Yeah, yeah, it's like, it, I mean, like, I think it was a whole thing of, like, we'd seen her, like, them, like, FaceTiming and stuff, and she had been sending food by mail and stuff, and he always really enjoyed it, so once she actually arrived in person, he just zoomed right to her in with a hug. Grandma, please feed me, I'm pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> like, you have to understand, the only thing I got going for me is, I hungry. Aww. With her being a grandma, it's like, oh, poor baby. <laughs> like, I got you covered. <laughs> Lovely. But yeah, uh, but being, like, with uh, him being, uh, the dad being very pathetic, it's just, you have that, in the, which is, like, so funny to me. Then you have Mom, who goes from badass and collected to the next thing you know is like, oh, she's unhinged too. They're just different brands and unhinged. Yeah, yeah, she's just very much like a bit of, like, they're both a, a different type of neurotic mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel one ends up being, which is just, this is something I can actually relate to when it comes to Pete, is denial of being in a bad situation mm. and, like, the, like, trying to put a positive spin on it no matter what. Whereas uh, Sharon, the mom, her thing is almost a bit more on the aggressive side of ready to be defensive, ready to attack. Honestly, it kind of reminds, like, the two of them kind of reminds me of the dynamic between my mom and my stepdad. I mean, they're oh. not together anymore, but, like, it's like a similar dynamic, only, like, it wasn't, a, it's not as wholesome. <laughs> is, uh, is your stepdad secretly being pampered by a ghost? Uh, I don't think so. Maybe, like... I think he just, I think he pampers himself with like weird diets and stuff and, and, uh, and nutrient supplements. Ah, he haunts himself in other ways. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so it's like, again, the characters in this show, I feel like, are so good and they like, they have all their own brand of weirdness and big personalities. And I say this because like even some of the side characters, like, you know, I'm going to mention Jeff. Yes. Uh, how do you spell like, that name again? Oh, 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 you you got me. But it's G E O F F, not to be mistaken with J E F F, which is like clearly not even a good name. Like, why would you spell it that way? <laughs> yeah, we do love G off. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm pretty sure it's pronounced Jif. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a GIF. <laughs> Yeah, Jeff is a gift, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, no, seriously, because, like, he's an interesting character, because you kind of expect him to be the Patrick of the show, which he definitely has elements of, like, season one Patrick. Um, with, yeah, yeah, like, before he gets, like, too much. <laughs> oh, you mean when he becomes an asshole? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not bitter. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not upset about the, not only the the assholery of Patrick and him becoming too stupid to live. I mean, that whole, everyone in that show kind of just became assholes. That's, we're not talking about this one. It's what happens when a show goes, goes on for too long, but then it kind of goes back around as we had season 10 or whatever. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Where they kind of, like, found themselves a little bit. They, they went on a spiritual journey. <laughs> but be not so subtly putting as many puns as I can throughout this aside. But yeah, Jeff ha definitely has, like, elements of those tropes but i feel like the interesting thing about it is instead of aggressive he's just straight up autistic coding with a lot of like there's been times i legit can't tell how much is him being very dumb and how much is he knows some things but he tries to like sneak by it especially with the the howling harriet episode where he was introduced with the, uh scratch having told him that like yeah, we'll hang out the second month after Never, or whatever. And then you have Jeff comes up, pulls up a calendar, which he wrote Never on. It's like, see, see? Never happened. <laughs> <laughs> and that just, in his mind, proving a point to, to Scratch. Like, there, there's like a slight deviousness, which I think ends up working out, because it's never mean. If anything, it's the manipulation of, like, the idea of you tricking me to sit down and watch something that I keep trying to put off, sort of, like, vibes. <laughs> Whenever has that happened? <laughs> Give me a while, I might think of something. 
<laughs> putting off the watching stuff sometimes, but I'm, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't call it manipulation when I'm going like, okay, we're watching this right now because I need you to watch this. <laughs> Meanwhile, over here like, no, but time. Oh, don't you know time's constantly ticking? How will we have time if we're hanging out? It's, it's easy, we just watch it while we hang out. Gasp! <laughs> that's that's some big brain type of thinking that we we need on this team. <laughs> Alright, you got you got me. Yeah, you're hired. <laughs> no, but G E O F O. Uh but yeah, with with him, like there's definitely is like an undertone but again it's never malicious it's just it comes across as he's been alone for a long time and he's trying not to be too much but he also can't read the room all the time yeah yeah and so it, it's like it's interesting to see like i don't know if that's the point of him him having like an autistic coding but specifically the brand of when you're an adult and like kind of hitting a lot of your symptoms because you've like adapted but you can't exactly hide all of them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I feel also like a uh, thing about Jeff is that, especially as you like get to know more, like just the development, like he doesn't develop as a character as much as you get to know him more. And I feel like you do it through scratch, you know? Yeah, so like I think the way we, the reason he's sort of perceived as like just this sort of like doofus in the beginning is because that's how scratch sees him. That makes sense because he's seen as just a dumb annoyance. Yeah, exactly. And then as he gets known better, that's like when you start to see his competence a lot more. Yes, and I really like that about him. Not only does that show, like you said, the, the ability of how Scratch's opinion on him changes, but also in general, it's nice to see just as they've like, instead of butting heads with Jeff being a bit too much and Scratch kind of like instantly repulsed by that, it becomes more of like you see the friendship of them blending together and so i feel like it becomes that balance of oh they're both shining here because of the fact that there's no resistance yeah it's just also interesting i feel like just jeff's role is very interesting and like you have a lot of moments where it just feels like uh especially with the whole when they're like cutting class or whatever mm -hmm. um, i love the gay episode but continue <laughs> Yeah, but that, that aside, um, it's just Jeff's just the amount of competence in Jeff in that episode, and and just also getting that vibe in previous episodes as well. Even though he was like meant to be sort of come off as like just this uh, like stupid oaf in the beginning, now he sort of evolved into like just the um, responsible friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you see, it's oh yeah, they it's the same seminar that they do every year. I got this. And then you see like. Wow, Scratch may not be because he's not responsible. He's kind of a big, like, fuck-up. He's constantly, like, getting close to, like, screwing himself over just from his own laziness and seeing how that goes. And, I don't know, it's, it's interesting now seeing Jeff and Scratch hanging out together, especially in the setting of, like, Bo's world. It becomes a thing of, like, oh, so Scratch is the loser. Scratch is the, the idiot compared to everyone else as far as, like, the ghost world goes. Yeah, I mean, that was sort of, you know, sort of spelled out at the very first episode, but at the same time, it's, like, it's hard to tell what credence you can give to a bunch of snooty assholes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because, like, the ghost council seems like they kind of I don't mean sexually, but they get off with really putting him down, and and it probably doesn't help that like Scratch, uh, he kind of gets off. No, not gets off. He. Give me a second. <laughs> I'm stuck in a loop of he gets off. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like that's not what I want to say. He's like, but you keep saying it. Um, yeah, he he's also kind of nasty. He has very much bachelor vibes of like especially without having to really account for anybody. It has a vibe of, I can get away with this because nobody cares. So why do I care? I don't. I'm going to eat trash now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's interesting when I think about it. I don't think, I don't remember last time I'd seen him eat trash in the like, next to last episode. You had to see him eat, like, sit in the trash can and eat trash. And I ended up thinking, like, huh, when was the last time I saw him do that? Episode one. Yeah, it's like the moment someone cooks for him, he just, he he'll take that which like, like makes sense but it probably tastes better even if he doesn't have to like sure he'll put in anything in his mouth but it's like eh. <laughs> but is it enjoyable <laughs> isn't there a difference between i don't know finding a two-day pepperoni on your shirt versus like a hot meal made with love 
Indeed. But yeah, like with Jeff, another point I wanted to make with that with the whole like responsible friend sort of role that he gets is that's also interesting in just how he's in regards to like Scratch and Molly and their relationship. Like yes. he's just you know, he's very understanding. He's just he's he's in their corner and it's not even a question. Yes. I also think, like, especially when you see in the, what was it, the scare tactics episode, when they skip the seminar, you have it so, like, he, in defense of Gratch, ends up going, like, yeah, but you don't understand. He might not know this, but he's, like, kind of changed the game, the playing field. You should see what he does with people at home. But the, the one time it slipped was because he, you know, like, speak in his favor. Which ended up working out because then you had Molly being like, Scratch, why did you leave me like this? He was just like, yeah, see? The new type of horror, Stockholm Syndrome. Give <laughs> me water. Okay, here we go. Look at Mika, drink water. <laughs> you were saying? What was uh, I saying? No, uh, Something about Jeff? Oh, oh, G E O. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff. Um, yeah, pretty much. The basic idea with that is just like it's interesting to see how this show does a really good job of not keeping characters one note. Mm-hmm. Um, I also feel like you end up seeing that with characters like Andrea and like Libby and stuff like that. Yes, I, I, um, Andrea, I like, love them both so much. <laughs> yes, I find Andrea hilarious, and I didn't ex- like. Well, I thought maybe I might like her, but then they didn't do much with her, and I was like. Oh, I guess she's just gonna be an asshole. And then she been, gets brought back multiple times, especially with the episode where she's the one that ends up saving... You know, by the way, spoilers, everybody, this isn't obvious. But, <laughs> like, helping do the charity so that uh, Molly can stay, and just her going like, Oh, uh, yeah, of course I do this. We're, like, BFF best friends. And, like, <laughs> the Fandrias would be so sad if, like, our friendship would be ruined. I also love her thing with... Like, I was delighted the moment they... They showed like that she had like a thing for geodes and like for the reason of being like inner beauty and stuff. Like it's it's so simple, but it's like it's just cute. I don't know. I just have a thing oh. for people who are into rocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was gonna say that the moment like that happened when I was rewatching with you because I'd watched this on my own. But yeah, the moment that happened, I was like, oh, rarity. So Mika's gonna like this because she's crazy about rarity. Yeah, like that, and also like um, here's a uh, see if anyone like. Uh, knows about this one, but uh, Sir Angelo from uh, Second Citadel, which is um, from the Penumbra podcast. Uh, he's yeah. a big old doofus. He's uh, just a big old himbo, and he's very obviously autistic coded about rocks. <laughs> yes. Like, not even coded. He's, I'm pretty sure he's, like, officially autistic by, by the authors, and he's just, he, he's just a complete, he's just very, you know, can't read a room for shit, always really loud. He's just a big old doofus, and I love him. But the moment something uh, is about, like, rocks and, like, minerals, he's just a genius. <laughs> rocks just bring something out of people. <laughs> yeah. Like, another one character I love who, who loves rocks is uh, fucking uh, Clumsy. Clumsy Smurf. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I have a thing for people who's into rocks. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you noticed, but, like, uh, rocks rock. You know what makes me hot? Uh, rocks. <laughs> if anything... Mineral. I can't even have my drinks unless it's on the rocks. <laughs> God. <laughs> I gotta have my mineral water. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no, that actually got me. <laughs> <laughs> gotta get that mineral. That's a classic. <laughs> Jeez. Like, did you guys even know that uh, salt, that's a rock. <gasps> oh my God. <laughs> and you need, like, sodium and stuff, or else you, like, fucking die. Mind blown. <laughs> This is so stupid. <laughs> Andrea in them. Like, I thought that was, like... Especially because, like, you also saw Andrea from, like, Molly's point of view. And Molly's annoyed by her. And yeah, yeah. that moment, it's like, oh, how much of this is just her being deliberate and, like, selfish? And how much is being obtuse? And how much is... We just saw this from Molly's point of view, who's like, wow, I hate rich people. Yeah, yeah. I can see, like... Because even though it's not... You know, that doesn't excuse uh, her behavior in earlier episodes... Still, like, if you take your time to like think about it from her perspective, once you get to once you know how she thinks, I can see why she would think that she's justified in some of her actions, even though it's completely wrong. <laughs> yes, you have a whole thing with like part of it's privilege, part of it's used to get in her way, and then part of it's like 
oh, her family just buys her love and doesn't really always consider her feelings if it's a case of like, well, financially, this is a bad investment, but it would make me happy. It's like, <laughs> oh, that's funny, sweetie. Anyway, uh, you know, time to go and like look at my stocks. <laughs> but yeah, you definitely see where a lot where it comes from. And so I feel like it makes her a lot more endearing than a lot of other rich characters in shows. Yes, yes, definitely. And uh, this also extends to, like, something about Libby when it comes to, like, her personality. You kind of get the, you have the idea that she's fluttershy of the group. Not to make more pony comparisons, (laughs) but you feel like she's the fluttershy. She's, like, very meek and, like, oh. And, oh, no, no, it's it's fine, it's okay. Then you see stuff like, oh, yeah, she can uh, actually put her foot down when it matters and you can see that she has her own vindictive and aggressive side like when she finally gets the meat scratch and like fights for like molly's friendship yeah also what i really like about just um molly and libby's like relationship is like how it begins because in the very first episode she's just kind of like a side character um Mm -hmm. and she specifically it's the thing of like her like having used to being sort of like the one that like um, the one that sticks out and like sort of ostracized. Then uh, you know Molly arrives and sticks out and is not like following the status quo and becomes the one that's also ostracized. And she just goes along with it. Like she's very much just like better you than me. Like just every man for himself. Yeah, but I will say like she's at least not aggressive like about it. It's just more of a oh oh yeah 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 this happens. But uh, well I guess maybe I can make a bit of a standing if like like I, if I stand over there i'm sorry but welcome welcome to brighton yeah like she's she's a coward like in the very very beginning she's just trying to survive and i like that honestly because i've had experiences where like uh like some some of my where like uh, some of my best relationships and best friendships didn't start on the best foot or like it's you know it's something where it's like i did not i didn't actually expect that to be a thing it's like you know it's a sort of thing where because with some Friendships, it's, you immediately know, like, oh, I like this person, I'm gonna try and be their friend, and then you, like, are lucky enough to succeed. But then it's, like, just, it's, you just see the worst part of a person first, and it, and, like, it gives you the wrong idea about them. You know, I can actually relate to that. When I was younger, I had a friend named Aaron, and he, at first, because of the fact that he was very impulsive, I used to be mad because a lot of my my more spontaneous and, like, uh, behavior and stuff like that was kind of literally and metaphorically beaten out of me. And I used to get mad in the beginning with him because of the fact that he just pretty much said and did whatever weird thought came to him. And I was like, hey, if I did that, then I'd get in trouble. But no one's calling you out on this? That's not fair. Oh, yeah. I've, I've... I've been feeling this a lot about people, like, these days, um... Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it's like, you know, I didn't have my habits beaten out of me, but I had them sort of, like, frozen out of me, I guess. Because, uh, like, it's a thing of, like, well, when I behave like this, nobody likes me. <laughs> wow, <laughs> you're cool. I realized that this until, like, accent? halfway through high school. <laughs> I, sorry, I just realized I... Not only did I talk of you, but I said the opposite of what I meant to say. Okay. <laughs> I said, wow, your consequences have actions? <laughs> see, see, this is what I get for being a piece of shit. I literally prove a point. <laughs> I'm sorry, you were, you were saying. I just mean, like, I just, you know, it's the sort of thing of, like, halfway through, like, once I turned 17, I sort of gained self-awareness and suddenly was like, oh shit, I've been an asshole my entire fucking life. Uh, and it just completely turned around my, just how I am around, around most people. <laughs> most adults, uh, like other adults, I guess, you know, <laughs> like authority figures when I talk to them, like, and I tell them, like, I used to be a really, I used to be a kid that, like, fought all the time. I used to be, be rambunctious. I, you know, I just, uh, I used to be a menace, you know? And people were like, what? <laughs> You're so sweet. You're so polite. I don't know. As someone who knows you, I can see that, and especially 
after now, again, making this comparison with, about my friend Aaron that I grew up with, he also got into fights very easily, and, and he ended up, like, growing out of a good portion of it, to the point where, like, as an adult, him being a manager of, like, a chain hotel, Ooh. and I'm just like, what the heck? How did you grind into this glow up? <laughs> yeah, where's my glow up? Where's my hotel? <laughs> when do I get to be this amazing and have money? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, like he, he was a menace who grew up to own hotels. I was a menace who grew up to have anxiety. <laughs> you know, the worst of the two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, like, it, it's interesting because, don't get me wrong, he's still, like, very blunt. He still has his moments of kind of being kind of being a nasty little boy but <laughs> i can say that because i've known him since we were in second grade <laughs> a nasty little boy who owns a hotel <laughs> his, his the nasty little boy who has a nasty little hotel who, who <laughs> just makes who just makes sure everybody has proper toilet paper in their room <laughs> i don't know that picture <laughs> because they're nasty <laughs> I'm sorry, we can sidetrack. No, but, like, the thing of, I, I get the distance in yourself at first, but then, like, over time, especially because then you had the Howling Harriet episode where Molly specifically joined equivalent of the Girl Scouts to try to find her new BFF and then, like, really allowing Libby to have her moment to shine. Mm, yeah, she like, she's already decided, like, yeah, Libby's not an option. <laughs> yes, and then by the end, it's like, yeah, she sucks at, like, all these other things I expect out of friends, but then... Oh, she has the it factor. You know, really the only factor that matters when it comes to friendship. <laughs> wow, I like her. Huh, it's almost like this is the only thing that mattered all along. I feel like once you actually like properly like a person, everything about them becomes interesting. Yeah, it becomes a lot more endearing. Uh, I, I think also a case of you also give them a bit more slack. If you used to think someone, like for example, was blunt before, getting to know them, your brand ends up understanding how they think, and you almost like excuse it a little bit. It's like, oh, they didn't mean it that way, technically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it definitely like an important part for that to work, though, is that that it's a give and take sort of thing, which it is, and like it uh, definitely is between uh, Molly and Libby. At least it becomes more that as they progress. Yeah, 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 and then. It becomes like not only Libby putting up with a lot of Molly's more wilder antics, but then also Molly being able to like learn how to handle not only Libby's more neurotic side, but mm. also her own like possessiveness that she ends up having. Which again, good for her. I like seeing that on her. <laughs> yes, especially with the episode where she and Scratch finally meet. It becomes a thing of like them both having this thing in common, even though you don't expect it because of how different they are coming from a place of no she's my first friend back off <laughs> which also just becomes funnier when you realize that scratch is just like a grown middle-aged man arguing with like a what 13 year old <laughs> yeah <laughs> about like, to throw hands with a 13 year old well maybe maybe they were dick and deserved it you ever think that <laughs> Like, well, maybe if she cut back the sass a little bit, she won't be seeing these ectoplasm hands. <laughs> but, yeah, it's, like, the character development below me a show that even when it's episodic, it, like, got this sort of, like, consistent and well-paced character development. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, even it doesn't have to have, like, a huge, like, overarching plot. It's, like, as long as it feels like time is progressing. It becomes not only the, like, side characters, it's also the background characters that you're learning more about their lives and you're seeing oh yeah here's a trauma here that molly helps them through here's a trauma there and not only that but the one episode of shoot what was his name the guy that she did the internship for was it larry was it larry's <laughs> like weird larry or whatever which oh also by the way before i get into that wanted to say her thing with hating the the magician is so funny to me considering i think he's pretty tame in general as a person it's just the act of him uh, doing magic is just too much for her yeah she just hates stage magic magic for some reason like there, like i've seen st other people like you know like amateur stage magicians that are so obnoxious like in real life and in media and like this guy's just like you know he's just existing <laughs> I can see, like, especially in the one episode with, uh, with his whole, like, oh, yeah, like, we're being recorded, like, papa, papa. <laughs> but then you have the other episode where, uh, he's like, ah, yeah, yeah, magic's not paying the bills, uh, 
I'm going to need to be paid, like, if you want me to do this, to clean your gutters, $300, please. And then just being flat out laughed at for it. It's like, oh, 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 not only are you, a, like, a shitty magician, but you got humor. You, you got that. He's like, no, 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 I'm being serious. He generally doesn't seem like a, that bad of a dude, so it's just funny that both Molly and her dad just seems to, like, genuinely just dislike him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so weird. <laughs> Yeah, but the sidetracking, but, like, you have, like, weird Larry, whatever. And in that episode, it becomes a thing of, like, yeah, Molly having to learn to appreciate things about people. Yeah, like, I feel, like, I really like that they, they aren't, def- I enjoy that the show is making her grow away from, like, like, yeah, it's good that she's just this, like, you know, ball of sunshine, but they acknowledge and make it a thing about, like, that her joy and, uh, can be overbearing. Mm-hmm. And how, like, and she because of her, like, view of the world and, like, how she thinks that there's, like, like, things need to be done in a certain way to make people happy. Like, that gets in the way of her actually making people people happy. It becomes a thing, which I think everyone kind of needs to learn, is <clears throat> that one person's happiness isn't another person's happiness, and that to unhappify the world, you kind of have to stop and listen. You have to, like, kind of learn to read people and realize that, oh, yeah, this makes no sense to me, but clearly he's happier this way. Yeah, yeah. Mal- so Mal needs to, like, just learn to listen and, like, sort of get past her bad habit of, like, sort of leaping before she looks. Because yes. just due to her just absolute enthusiasm. <laughs> yes. it, it becomes a, a thing that I think, like, throughout the show, uh, I hope we end up seeing more of. Because I feel like with characters like that, you have to kind of see, like, oh, even though you like them, they're the main characters, and they're a very big ball of sunshine. They're not always going to be right. They're not always going to be in the right, in fact. And I especially like seeing that. It makes me think of, like, with the, the Mickey Mouse shorts, where you have, where you get to see Mickey end up, like, finally, after all these years, have episodes that go like, hey, you know what? Sometimes Mickey's just flat out wrong. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, hey, guys, have you ever thought that, like, maybe Mickey can be his own piece of work and that uh, maybe sometimes also Donald can be right? Yeah, have you thought about that character flaws actually make characters better? <laughs> uh, it's characters that are perfect are worse. <laughs> for those who don't know, uh, my, like, because I imagine me going like, wow is wrong with her with Mickey? What does she have against Mickey? You, with the Mickey Mouse shorts, nothing. They're perfect. But, uh, I still, I'm still holding a grudge from when I was a child of, uh, of House of Mouse where Mickey could do no wrong and Donald constantly being kicked around and also you had, like, the episode of him getting jealous because, oh, people are putting focus on, uh, Ludwig von Drake. How dare they? Don't they know this is the House of Mouse? Oh, 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 you know what? I was right all along. Eat that. You got you got so upset at that that you drew fan art of Mickey being apologetic towards him. He needs to. <laughs> I know, like part of that part of like how I'm sounding is a bit put on, but I'm legit. I legit was so pissed at that. Mm, uh, I, and then it, again, it becomes a thing of when you have a character that's always right, even if like morally. And, like, within the show, you see that they're not. That sort of thing just ends up bothering me in general. So I appreciate Molly having her own moments of being put in her place. We don't really want... You never want a show to be, like, victorious. (laughs) Yeah. 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 But, yeah, moving on from characterization and stuff like that a bit. I mean, we'll get to that again later in a different way because I have something else to say. But... (laughs) Uh, I wanted to talk about something I thought thought was interesting with the ghost world itself. I've noticed there seems, like, you especially see in the last few episodes, but you see it as early on in the beginning with how people treat each other. Yeah, they're all just kind of, like, assholes. <laughs> yeah, you especially see that with, like, the chairman. Yeah, they're, like, the, the biggest dicks to ever dick. But I also feel like that could just be because they're used to, like, having power and nobility and, and like, having a say over things. So that, that doesn't surprise me. That's kind of a class thing. But the part where it seems like in the ghost world, happiness isn't allowed and misery needs to happen, which you end up finding out later ends up tying to the chairman reaper guy feeding on it. So I don't know like how much of the the world is centered around the fact that they've just been feeding this guy this whole time through like eons of however long ghosts have existed and then how much of that is they say that ghosts stick around because of uh, like they have unfinished business them being like miserable throughout their lives and angry anything like that 
And so it makes me wonder how much of that has been because of the chairman and how much is been built into their law of like, this is the way things are. Yeah, because I mean, like, the, if we don't know how the rules uh, of ghosts like are in this world exactly, but like the general rule of a ghost is, you know, it's it's a spirit with unfinished business and once they do finish their business, they can like move on to whatever goes on in the afterlife, like in the, in the true afterlife rather than being stuck. And even then here they have a ghost dimension rather than, you know, a spirit stuck on earth. And also they have a thing of not only did the ghost doctor make a point of like, oh, his happiness being a an infection of sorts, but you also saw that some of the characters seemed to act very negative when Molly became a wraith and was like spreading happiness. Not all of them. I noticed it wasn't all of them. Some of them seemed to genuinely had a positive reaction to it. But then you had some characters that seemed to drastically flinch and make comments about like how her joy burned. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see it being a thing of, like, even if, like, the, the place is, like, sort of designed to have, like, people be miserable and stuff, that doesn't mean that a lot of people are, like, you know, not trying to be happy. Like, you have Jeff, like, he clearly is, like, pretty jolly soul, but he doesn't have, but he's still not, like, you know, bursting with joy the way uh, Molly is. Though I do wonder how much that has to do with her, like, not actually being dead. Oh, yeah, that was from her being, I guess, a living soul I just, like, after projected mm. but i guess you could make a, a theory that some of that might be just how warm and vibrant she is just from being alive more so than that's her personality there's a lot of like jollier people in the world even if the assholes are not like you've seen they're like also spirits that she's met before that she made happy but in the ghost dimension looking as gray as ever. Like you have uh, not only mentionings of like Jeff being a pretty good guy and then you have how much Scratch has been happier and benefiting from it. But you also had uh, the ice skater lady who makes mm -hmm. a comment like how much Scratch and Molly has helped her and how she was able to move on from the living world into the ghost world because of it. And not only that, but then you have like Abraham Lincoln and he was a bit snipey, but yeah. You can't have like the America's favorite president be an asshole. <laughs> I mean, he's kind. Of, like, sorry, mom. Mom came in, so like I. <laughs> you know, I don't know what to keep that in, because <laughs> that was funny. Like I was being <laughs> by, like mom, just mom saying like Ringo is still outside. Like, well, then let him in. Anyway, um, and then you over here was like, can't have America's beloved favorite president, the 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 good boy of the country end up being an asshole um mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah but yeah so you have like him even he's like a bit snipey but a lot of that could also have just been because of scratch making a point of just all not only all out lying but lying about him is like that's the one thing i'm against lying <laughs> <laughs> yes the one thing he's against well he's also against slavery <laughs> yeah. look that's a get look hey <laughs> shut up i mean isn't also isn't that kind of ironic though because at the end of the show, like, it's kind of, like, revealed that they've all sort of been slaves to the chairman. Wow, that's deep. <laughs> <laughs> wow, dude. Like, when you really think about it, no matter if you're, like, alive or dead, aren't we all just, like, a slave to something? Whether it be, like, the literal Green Reaper or, like, capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, just, like, kind of blows my mind a little. <laughs> Yeah, but, like, I just find that interesting, because, like, he, he was a bit, like, I'll say, again, a bit snipey, but I also feel like, compared to, like, some of the other ghosts that we've seen, he's a lot more jovial and, like, willing to talk, even to Scratch, who, like, has a reputation of being, like, the loser of the ghost world. And so I just find that interesting, because it, it shows, yeah, even people like him, that you don't have to feed on misery. Like, you can just be cordial and, like, still exist. Yeah. But I also you think that also... Uh, ties in with the whole well it's okay if you're a knight like that towards other ghosts but the moment you do it to a human uh wow that's <laughs> the worst it's time for you to die in fact have some more queer coding <laughs> yeah yeah like i was thinking about too like again also i feel like just jeff's part in in the show like him being just that sort of like understanding reasonable friend like this, his role in that whole situation added to that queer coding in a way especially with him trying to hide molly and get to scratch yeah oh speaking of which by the way I, I don't remember if we talked about this him like going through all that trouble to save scratch his 
moment of badassery. Yes. Like, I'm like, you just, my brain just like stopped during that, and I'm like, oh my god, what a glow up! <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I saw the moment that was like, oh, this, you, you gotta love when like just a uh, some real silly guy suddenly just pulls up a pulls a serious face and it's not hilarious i mean it's a little bit hilarious but it's more just cool and it's hilarious just because like the joke's on you <laughs> yeah you as the viewer because it's like oh i thought you were just the silly willy joke man that but actually, like you're a tumblr sexy man <laughs> when did this happen <laughs> Like, he, he pulled a total, like, Grunkle Stan fighting zombies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He rolled up his sleeves, and then suddenly was like, Oh my god, this is kind of hot. I'm not allowed to think this about Jeff. <laughs> wow, wow. And he's determined to not only save his kind of adopted child, but, like, it's for the man he loves. This... <laughs> touching. It, it stirs things in my soul, you know? I can't believe the ghost of Molly McGee said gay rights. Actually, I do. They have a lot of queer background characters. <laughs> yeah, like, especially with the teachers and stuff. Like, this show, how open they are with gay characters, even if it's just, like, they exist in the background, but they're still prominent, and it's not hidden the same way, like, back in the day with Star versus the Forces of Evil, where it's, like, background characters maybe do a smooch, but even then, that might be too far. Yeah, yeah, here it's, like, just straight up, like, like, yeah, it's a background character, but, they, you know, they have several lines, or they're even the focus of an episode sometimes, to, to some degree. You gotta, just, like, you know, good, just good, casual, um, queer representation to have just... Some uh, middle-aged sh- lady go, my laugh. <laughs> my laugh. <laughs> it, it does things for my heart. It's like, oh, look, look, we can just make this normal for once. We don't have to make this a fight. I don't remember if we ever saw any uh, queer, if we saw any, like, queer male couples. I don't know if this was, like, canon, like, in the sense of, like, I don't know if I was supposed to interpret this way, but in the episode when... Scratch is scaring away like buyers. There were two uh, about 20, 30 year old men who ended up coming to like look at the house to buy that he scares off and they kind of looked like they were a couple but I guess they could also be bros. Nothing wrong with that. But Yeah, like I with them, like I was thinking it too but just the, I feel like the body language between them was like too vague to really give a feeling if whether they were a couple or if they were just like roomies. They were roommates. <laughs> oh my god, they were roommates. <laughs> and then they got scared by a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> and then they weren't roommates anymore. <laughs> In fact, I think, like, Scratch just kind of broke up a couple. <laughs> <laughs> you just keep using that, using that cadence. <laughs> Number 15. <laughs> just look at this little creature. <laughs> this I'm little sorry, creature. my brain That's has it. He cannot change it. <laughs> If he fits, he sits. <laughs> oh my god, stop. <laughs> I'm sorry, my brain has just been... I've been hearing that guy, like, I've been I've been hearing him for, like, a year or so, whatever. But, like, <laughs> it's to the point where he's, like, breach containment to where everyone's making fun of him and all the stuff I watch. And I'm like, you can't do that. That's gonna make him, like, duck in my brain. <laughs> You're just making him more powerful. <laughs> he's going to take over. <laughs> oh no, no, now I'm doing it too. <laughs> Oh no, this is like certainly a problem. Oh. No, but seriously, uh, like, yeah, I, I wasn't sure about that, but other than that, I think it'd be good if they had a the opportunity to have a canonical male relationship, because I think that tends to be the thing. Queer stuff, it seems like it's harder, unless they're the main character's dads, then they're like not really a thing that shows up in shows. Yeah, yeah. It's gay just... men can only exist if <laughs> no sorry <laughs> gay men can only exist if they're like your your family you know like they don't exist in the wild yeah I, I think it's again the whole thing of like just sort of you know how like I feel like female queer representation ends up going around much more because both because you already have like the whole gal pals thing so it's easier to sort of hand wave away if uh like for homophobes to like, hand wave away, I was like, they seem like good friends. Um, but when it's two guys, then you have toxic masculinity to deal with. Exactly. You don't uh, want these guys to be soy boys. And like, also, like, I feel like that's sort of, I mean, even though you have like the predatory lesbian trope, 
uh, I feel like that sort of predatory stigma is still like stronger towards men than women. I see what you're saying. I agree. Especially with like historically having women being allowed to be like fake married even before like gay marriage was a thing. Mm. Uh, what were they called? Like the sister wives or something? I don't know. I don't remember the phrase. Yeah, I, I don't know. Also, you have way back in the day, but that was like both men and women would you know have like basically you know super duper besties but actually they were gay <laughs> yes it was just in fashion to write like really romantic letters to each other <laughs> oh yeah yeah it's nothing like alexander the great talking about how much they like love and want to smooch this man and how they miss him mm. keeping luck over the hair of your best bros is so in right now <laughs> yeah this is like what you just do it's normal don't look at me <laughs> anyway but yeah, yeah, Where did this stem from? <laughs> yeah, queer like, representation. Queer, queer people. Where did, the, where did they come from? <laughs> where did they come from? <laughs> where did they go? <laughs> Got an idea. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That moment for Jeff. Yeah. And uh, just the whole thing of... Um, Having a forbidden friendship. Yeah, exactly. That's just like peak classic queer coding. <laughs> and it's great. I'm happy for them. <laughs> <laughs> we support this <laughs> I will say I am interested because of where the season ends, where that's going to go. I, I'm curious to see if now that Molly not only knows how to turn into a wraith and can go into the ghost world, how much that's going to bleed in, into the next season. And not only with the chairman having, like, you know, been casually exploded. I hope there's a twist where, like, the, the chairman is still there, but he's, like, really tiny. You know what might be interesting? Uh, if they did for the chairman. Did you ever read the one My Little Pony comic where Discord becomes a cord? I don't think so. Yeah, what happens is he ends up becoming order and he's ordered to the Oh, point wait, okay, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I misheard you. Like, because I'm also, I got confused because I talked about, like, because I talked about, like, the, the chairman being small. <laughs> well, okay, if you'll let me finish. Like, I understand that. But, like, I also kind of hope it ends up being a thing of the chairman comes back as, like, some sort of form of, like, pure joy. And, like, at first, you're scared for a second, then it's like, oh, this is fine. Only to, like, maybe at the end of the season be a thing of, like, oh, this is actually bad because positivity and, like, the idea of being controlled of what you can feel, like, emotionally. Maybe that's bad. Maybe we should just let people do whatever the heck they want. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be opposed to him just being tiny and having to like you know gain misery again yeah i don't know it just it just seemed like a possible little twist to have like once the new season begins because like all we saw was left was like his cape and it was like oh yeah he's just like hidden under there just <laughs> have him <laughs> yeah just have him just like kind of crawl out from it weakiest little voice <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry I'm, my brain just went imagine to, like, no what are you gonna say imagine what if they did something really like wild long game overarching plot twist thing mm -hmm. where like at like an early episode we gain a new character into the like sort of a new member of the fam like we get a new member of the family like a pet mouse or something oh that'd be that'd be oh i see what you're going with this yeah 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 mm -hmm. it's like oh yeah like we like oh new friend mouse and you see them there always watching always observant and then when they think like when they get caught just suddenly go back to like spinning on their wheel or something <laughs> Yeah, yeah. At first, it just sort of seems like, oh, it's just like, you know, it's just a rambunctious little little thing, and so, and you have the typical, you know, chasing after a, after an animal on the loose can like lead to misfortune, <laughs> or like, oh, you know, like the whole thing, like sneaking into places where are not supposed to be, revealing secrets, and it all just sort of see like you don't really think about how uh, like the connection of like maybe they're doing this on purpose. <laughs> you know what I also like about that? It puts an interesting twist on a familiar trope of like tom and jerry where this time it's like oh no it's not necessarily a thing of well tom is in the wrong because he's the one trying to kill him where really it's a thing of oh jerry was just a piece of shit this whole time <laughs> <laughs> not that we really have a tom right in, in this equivalent you know scratch would make a good tom or you think he just hates the mouse for no reason <laughs> Yeah, and then everyone else is like, oh, he's just a mouse. Is like, no, he's not. He does things on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, it's, it, like, maybe it's just, like, he doesn't really, like, well, he doesn't hate the mouse at first. It's just like, eh, you know, like, I don't get it. Like, it's just the fil just the filthy animal. But it's like, yeah, like, I guess you live with us now. That's cool. But then, and then just, like, the mouse is just, like, bullying the shit out of him. <laughs> yeah, as time goes on, just him going, like, he's doing this on purpose. He's manipulating. 
kidding you? Like, what are you talking about, Scratch? He's just a little guy. Yeah, he's a little something, all right. <laughs> he just keeps, like, like setting him up for trouble. And then he finds out, me up. <laughs> like, I, I didn't do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then he finds out they've just been feeding on the, the misery, but, like, also, especially if it adds, like, a bit of, like, discord to the family, you know, dynamic. Like, geez, Scratch, you really need to, like, chill a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like... And basically just feeding, like, feeding on the misery of the family enough to, like, grow strong enough to sort of move on to the town and then, you know, just regain their power completely. He's, he's especially in contrast to what a force Molly tends to be, especially if you, like, gaining power and then also, like, dwindling with a bit of uncertainty there. I can see then being a thing of having, like, such a huge comeback. Yeah, yeah. Can I say I actually absolutely love that, and if that doesn't happen, I might be a little sad. <laughs> I mean, it would be in, it would be insane if that exactly that happened. No, no, it has to happen. It has to happen exactly like that. Or if anything, I'm gonna write such a positive. No, not positive. I'm gonna write such a big <laughs> negative review and be like, I can't believe that this story wasn't anything like what we had talked about on our episode of my channel. <laughs> like, it's not what I would have wanted after we just made jokes for like a second. So clearly, I mean it's not good. <laughs> I mean, if it did turn out to be exactly that, I feel like I kind of would want to send a cease and desist. <laughs> like, oh, you know, when you send a letter of like, hey, that was my idea. I think you were listening to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the people at Disney were listening in. <laughs> They've been Honestly, there do. All Please the do. We, we love steal all our ideas as long as they happen. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I don't care too much. Like, as long as I get exactly what I want. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Like, oh no, it would be a shame if they took this idea. Oh. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, okay. Can I have a glass of water? <laughs> no, it is all okay. If anything, I think, I think I would be so miserable and heartbroken if they stole my idea of a mouse in the house. <laughs> Like, oh no, don't do that. I'd hate it. <laughs> oh no. Whatever will I do if when I bend over to pick up this pencil and Disney just decides to take my idea? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, hello, big corporation Mickey Mouse. Mm. Oh, I sure hope nobody comes and plagiarizes me. <laughs> oh, I would never want that. <laughs> I want you to know, like, I got weirdly into that, and I did, like, a weird, like, limp wrist thing. <laughs> um, what, what, what does your wife think of that? <laughs> She's busy writing stuff over there for, like, an RP, so I think, I think we're safe <laughs> for, for being found out that we're, that we're trying to, <laughs> we're trying to toxically seduce Mickey Mouse. <laughs> like, oh, 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 don't mind if I do! God. <laughs> I'm done! I'm done! I'm sorry! <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh yeah, uh, Disney... Dizzy... Dizzy? <laughs> Dizzy! Right here on the Disney Channel. I have anemia and I can't stand. <laughs> 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 That's so stupid. <laughs> no, no. Okay, focus. 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 So, yeah, I was gonna, like, transition away from... That weird place we went with Mickey Mouse in the end, and like, uh, talk about like the final point I wanted to bring up. I wanted to talk about why one of the things I think, like, personally really sells this show to me ends up being the fact that Gratch is voiced by Dana Snyder, who people who don't know that's the voice of Master Shake. I think that's one of his more popular roles, although I think he's also done voices on like other adult swim shows like Squid Billies and stuff like that. Uh, you know, popular show. <laughs> Aqua Teen Hunger Force is like very popular. That's like an iconic show. That some, I think they had a special that just came back recently. But uh, I'm glad he has work. <laughs> the like, Bible. But scratch. That's the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You question the Lord. Like you know, Scratch, the best character, <laughs> talking about manipulating everybody and like I'm gonna get bitches and hoes. <laughs> so Disney with. Uh, I feel like like people who know him as Master Shake already know that he's a really funny guy. 
um, we already know that, like, he's really good at getting the inflection, especially of just, like, saying some of the meanest, like, weirdest stuff, <laughs> um, which I think ends up working, especially in the beginning with Scratch's character. But I also feel like he ends up having uh, another comparison I want to make is in, um, I think it's Justice League action. He plays Plastic Man, which is one of my, like, favorite superhero characters in general, because, like, Tom Kenny has, like, for years been voicing him. But in that show specifically, they, they just suddenly have a master shake there. And I'm like, oh, I love this. This is actually really endearing here. He still has kind of that, I want to say, airhead stupid, like, attitude to him. But they change it a bit where I feel like it comes off as a bit more oblivious. And, like, just being bad at, like, understanding boundaries rather than intentionally malicious. It, it's one of those things of, like, he's not going there to start problems. It's just nobody likes him. <laughs> also, so I find that interesting, just to finish this thought, I find that interesting because Scratch ends up having, like, being this good middle ground of both of those t sort of characters, you know? I was wondering, um, isn't, uh, this voice actor also, like, isn't that, doesn't he also voice, like, Snagopus in Jellystone? He does, and it's amazing! Yes. Like, he did a really good job doing the Snagopus voice. Like, it, it has its, like, it. it's not, like, a perfect like recreation but it makes it its own he makes it his own and it I, like i said this with jellystone in fact this is gonna have to be its own video with jellystone in general so yeah. plan for you gotta plan for that mika i'm gonna force you into that yeah, um, yeah. i mean that's one of the shows that i like i, I have caught up on that <laughs> with that know. it's enough so that uh, i noticed the difference because i feel like i'm one of the few hannah barbera fans out there that give a shit <laughs> um but so like i notice it it's not that on but it's also a natural progression that's what that show does really well in general but specifically we're gonna give we're gonna give our pal uh, scratch the the credit here he does well of making it feel more modern while still keeping the spirit of the character yeah yeah and so like again and that's also another character who's like self-absorbed that's another that's, yes. this, this, he's typecast this poor man has been typecast Sassy, selfish man. Which, just gonna throw that out there. That's, again, with queer coding. <laughs> yes, oh my god. I'm not gonna call the man out, but he plays a gay man. <laughs> <laughs> and like, he does it well. Gay bitch. <laughs> just imagine, I'm sorry, I'm like, I just, as funny as that is, I just slightly embarrassed myself, imagine myself going up to him and going like, Mr. Snyder, you play a gay man. You do it well. <laughs> well I remember you went like, Mr. Snyder, you play a gay bitch. <laughs> like, I like that about you. <laughs> you got spunk, kid. <laughs> You're a keeper. I like the cut of your jib. You're hired. <laughs> well, what are you hiring me to? <laughs> a like, space in my heart. <laughs> just right there. You're right next to Tom Kenny and John DiMaggio. <laughs> I offer you, I offer you to live in my head rent free. <laughs> <laughs> Except you gotta let me, you, you gotta let me uh, think sometimes, you can't just. I have other characters that live up there that are ready, constantly interrupting me. I don't need you there, but I love you. Mwah, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, just look out, Cracker Jack licks all the toothbrushes. <laughs> <laughs> you know people aren't gonna get... <laughs> It's already bad enough, and my I literally have in my head a thing of my brain imagines it as Quacker Jack and the Mad Hatter have like an apartment, and then sometimes Doofenshmirtz just crashes for the weekend. <laughs> you know, or had him sleep on the couch. <laughs> oh, you know, I'm just came for a visit. It's just oh, the old ball and chain, Perry the Platypus. Just, <laughs> he kicked me out for a while. I hope that's okay with you guys. <laughs> what did you do this time? <laughs> Well, you see what happened was. <laughs> God, this is getting away from us. He didn't. He didn't seem to be appreciated when I. uh, Well, you know, I. I maybe made a. I made a bit of a scene at the diner, and it embarrassed him or whatever. Well, it's not my fault. They didn't make my food right. <laughs> <laughs> so he built a, a death rainator. I called it make a better sandwich in it. <laughs> But, carry out to thwart him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like sometimes, sometimes you just get grounded for a while, and so you have to go <laughs> hang out with your, gotta go hang out with your good friend, uh, Quacker Jack, and 
the Mad Hatter from Batman. <laughs> I like oh, that it's oh. one in your head. Isn't it's, it's not a regular old Mad Hatter, like the regular old Hatter. It's it's fucking Jarvis Tetch. <laughs> Yeah, 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 like, I'm, I don't have, like, mustard. Yes, mustard. Two spoons, yes, thank you. Lemon, that's different. I don't have that version in my head. Got this little whiny British bitch up there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we got, we got a bit sidetracked there. I just wanted to say, to, like, finish up the thought, I just think this role was made for him. Like, Scratch, like, not only does it feel like a character he was supposed to play, but it's a thing of, uh, I feel like, it's in his wheelhouse, but it's enough that this character feels different from all of his other characters that he's played. Mm, yeah, I think, like, think of just with my own ex- this experience with the, which is, like, limited, but, like, experience with his um, characters that he's played, I feel like this is the most nuanced one. I definitely think it feels like, even though it's still jokey, it has a lot more like, genuine, like, sentiments throughout. Yeah, yeah, it's not just, like, the sassy mean guy. <laughs> you know, there's one other character I think you could argue is, like, has this quality, but I also think because he showed up, like, once, maybe twice, because he was Greg's cousin in Steven Universe. Oh! And so, like, you had, like, them, like, going through their family squabble and, like, kind of getting pieces together and, like, him kind of opening up and being a bit less conservative and then realizing, like, oh, you know, I don't get this, but I, I, clearly this this family, little ragtag family works for you. And plus, hey, look, I got a, I got a kid here I can spoil. <laughs> yeah. Like, someone needs to, someone needs to be a bit more of a, I was about to say a bit more of a moral force, but like, eh, someone needs to put their foot down every so often, like, have this kid be part of the real world. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, that sort of character, I think, is like the closest I've seen to, like, someone who's, like, still rough around the edges, but feels like emotions you would actually see from somebody. Yeah, yeah, it's not just, like, every, every line is a joke. (laughs) I think I really appreciate that with Scratch, and I feel like this is really allowing him to be seen from that light as well. Yeah, speaking of like those sort of sentimental stuff, like I need to gush about, and this is a bit out of nowhere, but like... Yes? Tell me. Tell <laughs> I me need the gush. to gush about the whole finding his inner fear thing, and it being oh. like, when, when, like, just seeing uh, Molly like accidentally walk into this traffic and almost getting hit by a, by a garbage truck. Oh man, you almost gave me a heart attack. You could have died and then I would have been miserable. I like you alive. I care about you. Don't want anything bad happening. Yeah, like this, that, mm, I, I, those type of moments, just, I live for them. <laughs> it's like very much thing of like, especially, I can't, again, when you compare it to like how he was in the beginning, it just, I just get this like tingly feeling in me of just like, Oh, he's grown! I'm so proud of this middle-aged ghost. You see that? Growth. <laughs> you see that? You see that shows? Do this. Yeah, like, it can be as episodic. Like, you don't need, like, a grand, like, just hero's journey thing or whatever. Like, you know, it doesn't need to be a big Shira princess of, of power stuff. Or, like, Amphibia or Owl House. Like, I love those shows so much. But I also really like that you can have something this very, like, still quite down-to-earth and self-contained sort of, like, episodic uh, show. The mm-hmm. thing that makes it feel more, makes it feel real and, like, makes me attached to it is the fact that I can feel time progressing because the characters grow as people, as they get to know other people or, or just, like, experience life. I agree with that. I think I feel like you see this also in Craig of the Creek. It, it's a thing of everything is self-contained. It follows that sitcom formula very well, except instead of resetting, you make it so that episode mattered in its own way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, it's the sort of thing where, like, you might not have to. It's not big enough of a difference where it's like, oh, you missed this episode, then you're, like, gonna be completely lost. But it's, like, a thing of, you could probably, like, especially if there's, like, a significant moment, you could probably tell it, like, huh, I might have missed something that happened here, that, and that's why this person is behaving slightly different than you, than what I'm used to. Yeah, I feel like shows that end up doing that well, of course, you have, as we kept bringing up with My Little Pony references. Like, I feel like My Little Pony does that well of, you can watch at any time, but also, wow, things have happened, change matters. Another show I can't help but, like, relate to, even though, like, I feel like most people didn't watch it and didn't care about it, was um, Penguins of Madagascar that Nickelodeon did. They also had the thing of, the sh- other episodes will make reference to 
things that happened in the past like episodes but then also you see these different quirks end up developing and like stuff transferring to the other episodes even though it's self-contained like oh remember the time when you cared that we almost died and it's like hey you don't have to bring that up what the heck <laughs> i feel like uh i'm not sure that does this pretty well i think both like phineas and ferb and Milo murphy's law does that pretty well although Milo murphy's law still have like does have the more plot heavy element plot heavy elements uh plot heavy so elements. they tend to be more contained though at least for most of the series it tends to be more contained to the b plot when people are talking about how they don't like anything episodic, I feel like it's because they're not thinking of those sort of examples of shows where, yeah, it's self-contained, you can watch it anytime, but you get to be there with the characters, you get to see how dynamics change and how people get better. Again, I think they are so used to something episodic being the formulaic shit, the uh, shit <laughs> Shit, the sitcom, yeah, like I don't know. I love sitcoms. I didn't mean to say a sitcom. No, <laughs> no, but sitcom. That's the perfect word for sitcoms that are shit. Yeah, 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 just when it's like nothing matters. Of course, they treat it in like that. Yeah, yeah, groovy, nihilistic sense. Then because nothing matters, then I don't know why are we here. I don't know. I, I feel like when you have like characters with like enough intelligence to have like a meaningful conversation, then there needs to be some sort of development to keep you caring. Otherwise, I might as well, like, watch, you know, a Looney Tunes short. <laughs> Which is good. It's, it's good in its own way, but you're not expecting things to change at all with the Looney Tunes. Yeah, if I want the Looney Tunes to have, like, character development, then I watch the Looney Tunes show. <laughs> yeah, the superior sitcom. <laughs> <laughs> yes! <laughs> okay, That's Mika, sitcom, another thing. Because it's fucking sick and rad. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Let me talk about how... Daffy Duck has problems. <laughs> That's another video. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, we got we got to make a list. Yeah, make a list of just like us just ranting and gushing about all the shows we find underrated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, cause you know I'm gonna draw them again. You know I'm always like every so often going back to my shows and like I'm gonna do fan art. My followers are gonna end up uh, unfollowing because they didn't want this from me because I care about things. <laughs> We're gonna invent a brand new ship. <laughs> we did do that, and we're gonna make everybody see the way. Yeah, see the way of, of, of foul shipping. Look, you gotta know, they gotta know what a sugar daddy that Foghorn Leghorn is, and how he's like totally into, <laughs> totally Daffy into Duck. Daffy Duck. <laughs> yes, he says Muffin Man. <laughs> that He calls him that, sh guys, he calls him his Muffin Man. I love Goes to watch him <laughs> bear dance. <laughs> But yeah, I feel like people don't end up thinking about that, and so I think that's why, especially with, with just, this is good though, like, having cartoons be able to have these, uh, overarching plots, but I feel like, I feel like especially with the environment that animation is right now, I think the things that are episodic is kind of really important. <laughs> like, I feel like yeah, we need to like, we have both. Even with, like, this show, I feel like they've, they're starting to, like, which I think is smart, is, like, taking after the, f s sort of, like, the... F Bojack Horseman formula of you have a lot of like elements. It's not as heavy of like, you know, potential storyline elements as Bojack Horseman because, you know, on, I feel like with a, with a show for adults, you can live with having things be unresolved for some characters because it's like, that's just life compared to like a kid show where it's like, if a, sh if a problem is properly established, then it needs to be resolved or it feels wrong. Yes, yes. That as much here, so they didn't have like that problem as much here, but they did, uh, they did bring up a lot of questions about the world and stuff, but still resolved like the main issue of that season. Yes, yes. It's enough that I'm intrigued to see what they're going to do next, but I also don't feel like I've been like a cartoon blue balls, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like if it would, uh, if it like, were to not get to renewed, I have no idea if it's gonna renewed or not. It um, has. We're getting it has, like which is great. Uh, but it feels like when they wrote that they were prepared to not get renewed. It, it's very sad, but it's very smart of them. And it's like overall, I'm I'm intrigued to see where everything goes, and I'm also interested in seeing if more we might end up having more shows in the future that also does this formula yes I, I would i would very much like that like i hope that with that you can like sort of lean, lean a little bit more into like the plot area stuff because i feel like you or like getting in a little bit deeper with the character development 
because mm-hmm. I think that this like this is good, but I think I, like personally I would like it to go like just a little bit more like or drag like sort of have it a bit more gradual rather than especially with the plot stuff like it sort of didn't really get it the more plot heavy things until like right at the end. I feel like it was like the last third of the season. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. Like, well, having kind of tested the waters with everything, I feel like they might feel like it's a lot safer to do that. Because now we've learned about the characters and things like that. We know that they care about each other. Um, yeah. And so we like, care about them. Now we can just throw them off into the world. <laughs> yes. Fly, baby bird. Um, okay. I have an idea for how to wrap this up. Uh-huh. What's up? Uh, what are your wishes for the next season? Or future seasons in general? I want them to not be cancelled. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, no. Like, actual stuff. Uh, again, I would like to see more of the world building, especially now that Molly can... Like, we presumably Molly could, like, become a wraith at any time. I'd like to see more of that and see if that leads to, like, ghost dimension adventures. But I would also say, in general, I'm a simple man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I just want, I just want Jeff and Scratch to be in the same room and talk to each other. <laughs> what if, what if we were standing in the same room together and talk to each other and we were both ghosts? <laughs> just kidding. Unless. <laughs> Unless, Disney, unless. <laughs> no, but like, literally, like, look, as much as I would love, like, for that ship to end up being canon, I have enough of an understanding that, like, that, that might not happen. We've been pleasantly surprised before by media, like, recently. So I would, it's one of those things of, like, look, just keep giving me that, because their interactions just have me bawling. So, mm. like, as in laughing, not I'm not crying for like, oh, these sweet babies. Well, that's yes. me. That's me. Yeah, that's you, you, you do the crying. <laughs> yeah, you do. You, I do the feels, and you do the funnies. I I do something all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that that's more like my my hope is just if you put them there, I will come. <laughs> I said I will arrive. <laughs> <laughs> I, that, guys, that was supposed put to be. Man, you're below your load. <laughs> no, what I meant was that was a, I was making a reference to Hey Arnold. <laughs> if you plant them, right. they will grow. <laughs> like, no, I ruined this. <laughs> <laughs> no, but okay, okay, let's sweep that under the rug. What, what, <laughs> what would you like to see coming up? Uh, well, speaking of the gays, I would, I think it would be adorable. If Molly and Libby became a thing. Oh, that's the most popular ship. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's like, I just, I want to see, like, I, I will never get tired of, like, just, like, true, truly, like, queer adolescents. Like, I, I'm, I, like, you know, coming of age, like, you know, older, like, teens that used to, like, those teen, like, live action dramas. Like, I'm sick of that shit. But, like, having, you know, these cartoonish, cute, funny characters have like this sort of just like I'm figuring myself out ah (laughs) is that that's that I love it yeah yeah we got we got like that started getting that with uh Owl House yes we were starting to get that with Owl House but it does a good job it does what it is but like I also think in comparison you have the Ghost of Molly McGee which is a bit more down to earth and also just a lot sillier and so I feel like it would be it would be cute yeah to have them just be like so fucking awkward (laughs) Like, just imagine, I can just, because I could totally, you know, especially with Molly being, like, she, her having, like, this very extreme fear of change, and, like, the, her, like, the way she values friendship, and keeping the sort of, like, the, keeping things in her comfort zone, like, I could see her, like, just, the idea of her, like, developing feelings, and for Libby and becoming aware of it, she would panic so hard. You know, I've recently read a fanfic about that. <laughs> oh, Okay. <laughs> but no, I won't. I won't get too too much into the like fandom aspect. But yeah, I think that would work very well, especially when you go like you see this with like a lot of straight shows that go from like being friends to developing crushes. So I think it would be cute to actually get to see that from a gay perspective. Yeah, yeah, like there's not no like and without having to make it a thing of like oh two girls and that it's like oh my best friend. You know, as like it's been in like all the other shows out there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. I think keeping it along the line.
lines because then it also it goes with how the show's been handling queer representation anyway by just going like this is normal and just it becomes the aspect that like i think most people care about when it comes to like developing crushes on friends are like wow i don't want to lose my friend i don't want me to be the one that gets all awkward and like and just i'm the reason this is messed up and then they're not going to want to hang out with me anymore yeah 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 exactly it just makes sense like it would be really entertaining that and it makes sense that to have that be sort of the conflict if you go with that with that because molly is like that (laughs) molly miss queen of suppressing things (laughs) yeah i agree i think that should be another element that's allowed to like be added it would just be cute also i i'm just i am a sucker for repressed characters to be honest i mean if like i'm just saying if they went that route that would also make an interesting parallel because like i imagine scratch uh scratch is also very repressed but his comes out in a completely different direction through like anger and denial and i'm just saying bff solidarity of oh no <laughs> We we have feelings. What are we gonna do about this? Help help me, Malls. I need help with my old man relationship. <laughs> like, yeah, it's like you're gay. I'm gay. Oh, I can't believe we're both gay. I think I think that'd be cute because that's also not something I think we've seen in media that often. Not only to the main characters being queer and not for each other, mind you, but mm. like queer with having their own crushes and it's a generation gap. Yes. I feel like they don't play into that so much in the show because it's like he's a ghost, you know. Like, I feel like they the... played with it some, like when it comes to the generation gap, because he has had like a few moments of like kids these days. Mm, okay, fair. Like I think you see it more like episode two where he's just kind of like like making fun of Andrea, like how she talks and stuff. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think this has been the episode, and I want to thank you, Mika, for having, you know, helped me out with this and having, like, gushed for a while. I suppose I will be uh, going back into the afterlife now, if you'll excuse me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. so you mean, like, whoa, whoa, you mean you're, like, just dead forever now? Yeah, I'm speaking, you know, I'm, I'm like, done, you know? With, with everything? You know, we talked about, you know, we talked about everything between heaven and earth, you know? But I, I think we're good. Yeah, but I don't, also don't want you to be, like, dead. <laughs> I do, I do have, like, we did talk about all these other videos we wanted to make. Okay, like, once we're done with that, then I'm dead. Oh, then, yeah, then you'll be double dead. I gotcha, I gotcha. Well, I guess that just means I'm gonna have to bring you back sometime. Because <laughs> from now on, I'll curse you! From now on, I'll be by your side all the time until we talked about all of the obscure shows that we like. <laughs> okay, okay, I see what you're putting down, and I think I like that. But, uh, you know, as a hypothetical, uh, if I wanted to, like, summon you or see you in the astral planes again, uh, any any place I, I might be able to find you? Well, um, I do have a Tumblr. A ghost Tumblr, yes. Yes, it's it's my it's my ethereal Tumblr. Uh, uh-huh. I also have an ethereal Twitter. And both there, uh, both places I am known as Mika the 13th, M-I-C- a X I I I. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. I'll link all your information down below. And with that said, goodbye! <laughs> what a silly guy. Looking for more snark content? Well, you're in luck. You can find me over on Instagram, Tumblr, also here, I guess on DeviantArt, Fur Affinity. Holy shit, I'm in a lot of places. But most importantly, you can click on one of these videos. Eh? Eh? Yeah, I'm annoying myself too. Goodbye, everybody.